Raw. It's Tuesday. How are we all? Everything good? Spoiling my cow. Hope we're well. Um, welcome to my kitchen at tier three. We're going to talk about problem solving. Just make my own. Um, bank holiday weekend. Hope everybody had a good one. It was very hot where I was. Um, it's very sunny again today. So I hope everybody's managing to maybe work outside. That would be handy if you're not at work. Because some people will be at work. Kind of run out of tea-based questions. Um, so I thought I'd do something slightly different today. And um, I, what I thought I'd do was ask a biscuit-based question. I thought that's what we do. I thought we did biscuit-based questions. So I've got a question for you today. And um, it, last last year, so 2019, I don't know about it, 2020, but it was um, the National Biscuit Day. I can't remember the exact day. It was an amazing thing. And um, it was Britain's favourite biscuit. So my question today, try to answer in the chat. What was the nation's favourite biscuit that wasn't chocolate related? So four of the top five have got chocolate involved. Um, so what's, the, what's Britain's favourite biscuit that's got no chocolate involved? Um, the, top, the top four, or not the top four, actually. Um, I think these are the top four. McVitie's chocolate digestives. Chocolate fingers, quite surprised. Um, Jaff cakes and Cadbury's chocolate digestives. So rich teas come in early doors there. Custard cream, it's a fine biscuit. Uh, custard cream. Um, I've gone chocolate hobnob today, which I think is a, a very good biscuit and didn't appear in the top five. Because um, I feel like it's a bonus biscuit. Whoa, what's wrong with hobnobs? It's a brilliant biscuit, particularly when they're covered in chocolate, because it's two biscuits, because I've got chocolate and I've got a hobnob, so I'm very happy. I'm getting multiple biscuits for my biscuit, really. So I quite like a chocolate hobnob. Um, anyway, just squeezing my tea bag there. Um, hobnob, which I feel hobnob. Um, oh, no, I see. Clara actually, no, hobnob. Clara's changed. I thought you were offended at my chocolate hobnob um, selection. Oh, I got that wrong. I'm concentrating. Concentrating on my tea. Um, right, so I'll tell that at the end. I'll try and put that in again if anybody else comes on. Um, Britain's favourite biscuit, not chocolate related. Um, so Britain's favourite biscuit. And um, anyway, there we go. So we'll do some problem solving today. A uh, little mug from my uh, from my childhood, really. Other tabletop football games are available. Um, bit of a spooky mug there. Um, anyway, we're going to talk about problem solving. Um, what we're going to do for the next kind of few weeks, we're going to talk about some of the key skills that are perceived as being needed um, by various management thinkers, ILM, those kind of people. So these are the kind of things that we, th we think we're going to need. So we're going to, we're going to kind of split these through over the next four or five weeks. There we go. Um, see when people start going back to work. But what we're going to do, problem solving. So first of all, I've got a little, uh, a little model for you because we always love a model. Now, if you find anything out about um, problem solving, it's always like uh, it's a step process. Um, it's sometimes a four, sometimes a five, sometimes a six, sometimes a seven. So I'm just going to talk about them and, and some merge and some stay solo. Uh, but, but, uh, but the steps really, the firstly, identify, identify what the problem is. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the second one is check all perspectives. Uh, third is list of some solutions. Um, then it's evaluate the, the solution. So kind of test them out almost. Select your one and then document and implement. So sometimes people just go oh, identify it, generate ideas, do it, review it, that kind of thing. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about is that identify issues and also um, check others' perceptions. So when we're talking about what's a problem, um, we've got to make sure we get, we're getting to the source of the problem and, and we're not just float, floating about dealing with a symptom. That's one of the things. Now, what I mean by this is, is um, sometimes people just deal with a symptom of a problem. And it's a true story. I got asked to do some work for, for clients quite a long time ago. But, and it was about customer complaint handling. And they said, we're, we're kind of getting, we want to kind of reduce the complaints. And I said, okay. Um, so I said, okay, what happens then when, when somebody complains? And they said, they have like a book, a complaint book, yeah. So you realise it's quite a long time ago now. But um. What they did was they said, we, we make a note of the date and then we write what the complaint is and then we put who's going to deal with it. And then what happens is when it's resolved, we like say resolved on, you know, the 12th of June or whatever. But OK, so so kind of then what happens? And they said, well, what, what do you mean? 
And I said, well, what, <laughs> what happened? So you write in the book, you've resolved it, but then what happens? And they said, well, well, I say it's resolved. And I said, so what do, you, what do you do with the complaints then? And they said, well, they're finished because they're resolved. I said, so what happens if the same complaint comes in next week? It just goes back in the book. So all we're dealing with is a symptom there. We're not dealing with the actual complaint because we're just allowing it to happen. The complaints will always keep coming in if you're never resolving the complaint. All they're doing is a symptom, how quickly we can resolve it and not what the actual complaint was. So the other thing as well is check all perceptions there a little bit with um, complaints uh, because how you see it sometimes is not how somebody else sees it. Um, so what I see as a problem, other people go, well, this works perfectly for me. This is actually much, much easier. So, you know, but make sure we, we've got all the stakeholders involved. And then the next bit that I just briefly want to talk about is, um, is about generating some solutions. It's, it's probably one of the big things. It's kind of linked to creativity and one of the core skills, but we'll probably cover it here. But how can I, how can I be creative? It's kind of like I can't just turn a light on and go, oh, yeah, I'm being creative now. Um, you know, it becomes quite hard. Um, but one of the things I spoke about in in uh, in another one was how quite how our brain works differently. I just asked this question as well, actually, while I'm here. So let's just say I went to a little tea shop and I bought a cup of tea and a biscuit, and together these two things cost one pound ten. So together they I paid one pound ten for the cup of tea and the biscuit. But what I'm going to tell you is that the cup of tea costs one pound more than the biscuit. How much did the biscuit cost? Type your answers in. The tea and the biscuit, one pound 10. The tea cost one pound more than the biscuit. How much was the biscuit? How much was the biscuit? 10p. 10 pieces, Gemma. Anybody want to change that? One pound 10 for the two things. This 90p, the biscuit cost 90p. Let's see, I hope you're not doing our pricing. Uh, <laughs> so you're kind, of, you're kind of sort of getting there in a completely incorrect way. Uh, so one pound ten for the two things. Cup of tea costs one pound more than a biscuit. How much does the biscuit cost? And I'll give you a clue, it's lower than the lowest suggestion I've had. I'm homeschooling maths, perhaps I need to quit. <laughs> Oops, I meant to tell that's all right, it's still wrong, though. Uh, but it's a good guess. Uh, homeschooling, yeah, quit, Jim. The biscuit costs 5p, and the tea costs £1.5p, and together they cost £1.10. Gemma's answer is classic, 10p. Carly's in. Is, Carly, is there a time lag on this? Has Carly just come up with an answer once I've given it? Because that'd be impressive. It is 5p. Um, so our brain, again, is working quick. It feels like it's going to be 10p. So Gemma's answer of 10p is the classic answer we get here. And I can't, can't tell you how many times I've, I've had to like count money out and do things like that on the, on the training course before, but it is 5p. So brain works quick. So we've got to try and get our brain to work in a different way. Once we can, then we can be a little bit more creative. Simple ways that we can be creative. We can do the obvious things like brainstorming. That's fine. But remember, warm your brain up first. There's loads of little quizzes. There's loads of little things online that you can find. Um, we can do something called, um, you've got like a lot of noisy people. Like you put a lot of people with me and like me in a room and you're going to get a lot of noise. Sometimes what you want me to do is think in a different way. So we can do something like that we call brain writing, where we get like a noughts and crosses grid. So three squares on, um, you know, three by three. I get the first person in silence to fill out the top line, then put the sheet of paper in the middle. You could do this virtually as well. It would work. And so you build on other people's ideas. And that's called brain writing. Um, reverse brainstorming is where you try and break something. So you say, right, uh, let, let's say I, I want to set up a learning and development company. If I want to guarantee failure for a learning and development company, what would I have to do? And you kind of come up with ideas and then you implement the opposite. That's another way. And the last one I'm going to talk about is, is what we call the three R's. And the three R's are reverse, resize, and remove. And I've got a little story here. Um, because uh, you can see yeah, I've got a lot of grey hair, so I'm um, quite old. But when I was ill, when I was a kid, um, my mum used to go to the chemist and buy me a drink to make me better. And you can only buy at the chemists when I was a kid. And um, that, that drink um, came, out, came in a big bottle and it had like orange foil around the bottle. And its strap line was AIDS recovery. That's what they said, AIDS recovery. And... Um, 
that drink was of course Lucasade. Now, I said about remove, resize, and reverse. And what I think happened to Lucasade was they said, well, if it makes sick people healthy, can it make healthy people healthier? And so they started rebranding. That's about Lucasade gives energy. I don't want to get into the whys and wherefores of is Lucasade good for me. But, but you know, what we found there was they twisted it around completely. They've also resized because you can get smaller bowls. And also now you can obviously buy it anywhere. You can buy it in a pub, Lucasade, you know, that kind of thing. So that was one thing they did. Um, a great example of um, resize, and in fact, reverse and remove, really, is um, the iPod. So initially, um, when the iPod came out, instead of me going to the music, the music came to me. That's a, that's a great example of, of, of reverse. Um, then there was things about uh, resize, where they resized the iPod, made different sizes. There was the shuffle, there was the nano. All of those things. And of course, now that's actually been removed. You can't buy it. Well, you can buy an iPod, but they're very retro. Um, because all the music's on the phone now. So they've, they've kind of completely changed it. Even in what I'm doing now, you know, delegates would come to me, but now I'm going to delegates. It's a lot more online. So we're starting to work with that. And I really, really advocate this, this reverse resize remove. It's an excellent way. Now, a big thing when I'm trying to generate ideas and get the brain to work is, is you got You've got two bits of the brain. You've got that very structured bit, and also you've got that very creative bit. And the brain works best when you do both things. So you diverge to generate a lot of ideas, and then you narrow down. So each of these stages, we'd encourage you to be creative and then narrow down. It doesn't matter when we're looking at what a problem is, how to solve a problem. Generate some ideas. What ideas should be used? Yeah. How we implement it, best way to implement it. But often we kind of see a problem and go straight into solution mode. So that's why this, this process of identifying generate solutions. Then we kind of pick what's the best one. And one of the things I, I kind of talk about here is, is use something like a risk impact matrix. Matrix, You know, simple four box, risk and impact. So what's the risk if, if this fails or something goes wrong with it? And what's the impact it's going to have? So is it a high level of risk, low impact, that sort of thing? Or is it? High risk, high impact, because then we maybe we'll have to change it. So plot things on a risk impact grid. Um, and then finally, we, we kind of review it, document it and review it. How's it gone? Don't be afraid to change. And there's a, there's a great old exercise um, that the Tucson training courses a lot, which is uh, about build a spaghetti tower. And, um, um, and maybe if you've got kids at home, you can do this with them. And, and you say, right, who can build a really small, tall spaghetti tower? You know, use long spaghetti or what I call supermarket spaghetti, whichever. So you've got to put it together just using um, sellotape and spaghetti. And it's got to be able to balance like a tennis ball. And you've got like 10 minutes. And uh, what happens a lot with people is, is they build a tower. And then the first time they balance the tennis ball on it is what we call a ta-da moment. So at the end of the 10 minutes, people go, ta-da, put the tennis ball on it and the, and the spaghetti breaks off. But if you give it to kids, if you've got kids, what they would do is they would build it, put the tennis ball on, build it, put the tennis ball on, build it, put the tennis ball on. So constantly changing. And that's kind of how agile project management and problem solving has come about. But it's constant stop and review. And I think we need to do that. We don't just come up with an idea, put it in, and then review it, and then say, that's it, done. Um, so there are my little steps there. Identify it, generate some solutions, select your solutions, and then did it work? We can break it down in four, five, six, seven steps. And they're the key things. Try to give you some tips just how to be creative and think a little bit different. And there could be people still going, I don't get why that's only five to be. Now, the question I asked right at the start was what's Britain's favourite biscuit other than those chocolate-related ones? So there's the two chocolate digestives, um, which, of course, make visits at Cambridge, but free advertising for them. There's the Jaffa cake. A lot of people get offended at the Jaffa cake because I said it's not a biscuit. And the last one was chocolate finger, which is in fact second. But the highest biscuit is in fact just the plain digestive. So that's Britain's favorite biscuit that's not chocolate related. So that's me done for today. I'm gonna to enjoy my tea, enjoy my hobnobs. I'll see you Thursday. I'm gonna have a little chat about negotiation. Just be some of the skills that we need for negotiation, not hard sell negotiation. Look forward to seeing you. Um, enjoy yourself, have a safe Tuesday, and I'll see you Thursday. Thank you very much.